Hello everyone and welcome back to In the Spotlight. Today's guest hails from Chicago, Illinois. Paul Vallis has been one of America's leading educators and crisis managers for the last two decades. A Greek American who grew up in the restaurant business, Mr. Vallis, a former teacher, has served the Illinois State Legislator for 10 years. First as an advisor to the Education and Appropriation and Revenue Committees, and then as the director of the Illinois Economic and Fiscal Commission, which is Illinois' legislative, economic forecasting and research arm. During his tenure, he was involved in helping resolve numerous financial challenges and state economic development financial issues. Paul Vallis, former Chicago Public Schools CEO, is with us today to discuss why he decided to run for mayor of Chicago. Paul, welcome. Well, thank you for having me. I, it's a privilege to be here. Well, we're very happy and very honored to have you. And I mean, we have a lot to say. Uh -huh. What a huge undertaking. <laughs> Congratulations uh, well, on running for. Well, I haven't won any. I haven't won anything yet, but uh, in all the polls that I've seen, I'm either tied for first or uh, in second place. And it's a open primary, which means you don't run as a uh, as as a party right. affiliated candidate. And if if someone gets 51 percent, they win the primary. If if there is no one with 51 percent, there is a runoff. And most of the polls show that if I'm in a runoff with any of the candidates, I will, I'll be the next mayor. Well, that's wonderful. Good to know and, and wonderful to hear all about your views today. But before we get started on, on your candidacy, I'd like to discuss your background. Okay. You're a Greek American. Tell I us am. a little bit about your family. Well, my um, my grandparents were from Greece and uh, and they were from, um, my, on my father's side, they were from Valdeci, which is in Tripoli. Ah, Tripoli. Tripoli. Yes, so yes, yes, yes. Us in Kolkotoronis. <laughs> yeah, that's his country. As all a, the, as breeds leaders from all that the area. time. That's right. All the leaders come from there. Well, the leaders come from many areas of Greece, but we like to think that uh, Tripoli has had their share. Yes. But my grandfather, like so many Greeks, came here and made a business for himself. He was in the he was in the food business, and uh, you know, I remember growing up. Uh, uh, I, we lived on top of his store, and then I, I like to say that we migrated from a three flat to a two flat to a one flat to the suburbs. <laughs> and so it was it was that 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 uh, complete evolution. But uh, uh, my formative years were spent in the restaurant business. Um, me and my brothers, we joked that my my dad, who was a World War II vet, and, and came back and became an accountant. At one point in his accounting career, decided to open a restaurant, and we used to joke that he wanted to spend more time with his kids and with his family. So he opened the restaurant so we could spend more time working together, as we like to say. Uh -huh. But the restaurant business and growing up in the restaurant the business was just the, uh, the 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 greatest experience for me because you you really learn not only about entrepreneurship but you learn how to interact with people. And I was a stutter and stammer. I grew up as a stutter and stammer for many, many years. Uh, actually, I started and stammered uh, well into my 20s, and I, I, and I was such a severe stutter that in, into my mid-teens, sometimes I would just not engage in conversation. And growing up in the restaurant business and serving the customers and, and talking to the people around the, corner, uh, around the counter, uh, it not only uh, helped me overcome my stutter, or at least helped control it, but it really gave me an appreciation for the diversity of groups right. uh, of of, uh, of people around the counter because uh, you would have people that would just I mean you name the issue you name the issue there would be people on the counter on both sides and they would be debating it heatedly in the morning in the afternoon and in the evening before we would close so it was quite the experience. What do you believe? Uh, what values uh, did you carry with you on throughout your life that you believe stem from our Greek heritage? Well, you know, my father used to say that the most important thing, the most important thing you have is your reputation, and you must guard it because it's the one thing that you carry. It, it's the one thing that it, it, it's it's the, it's it's the most important thing of value that you have in your life, uh, and there's no substitute. And you know, I I, I think that uh, the Greeks are all about reputation. It, it it's all all about integrity. It's all about honesty. It's always about being fair to people. And you know, I think so. I, I think the the importance of having a rep, of being a person that your family can be proud of. Because let's face it, we come from pretty strong families, and that 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 molds us. It it, it defines us. You know, I have three boys, and two of my boys were in the service. One was a combat medic for the 5th Marines in Afghanistan. The second was in the Marine Corps. And they became police officers. And, uh, you know, I often, 
I remember my, my youngest son passed away in February, and I remember I would always ask myself, am I doing a good job? Uh, are they developing into, you know, strong men? And I remember when my son passed away and, and people came to, uh, to the funeral, I remember observing my, my, my sons, who are all tall and lean, but they, they physically have different features and they have different personalities. And they just, I mean, they're, they're a study in contrast. You know, but then I realized what they had in common, just observing them for the first time that closely. Uh, they're all, they're, they all grew up with no prejudices. They're kind, they're considerate, uh, they're respectful, they listen, they give comfort to those in need of comfort. And I said, that's what they have in common. That's, those are their common features, despite their different personalities. One is very generous with his money. The other is tight with his money. You know? <laughs> the other is outspoken and, 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 and very energetic and always enthusiastic. The other one is very, very serious. You know? I, but but you, know, you realize that those were the common features. And I think those are the type of features. Those are the type of characteristics that are that are a part of our culture and a part of the Greek heritage. I always point out how comfortably the Greeks fit into every community. You know, I spent a lot of time. I've spent time in Haiti. I spent time in Colombia. I spent time in the Sudan in my travels in Chile. Uh, I, obviously, I spent different. Uh, you know, I, I've had different experiences working across the country. I rebuilt schools in New Orleans. I rebuilt schools in Philadelphia. The, my New Orleans work came after Katrina. Mm -hmm. I rebuilt the, the, the school system there. But in each of these communities, there was a thriving Greek community. And a thriving Greek community that respected uh, the, the, the larger communities that they were a part of. But they were a thriving uh, a community that brought value to the, to the larger community. I think that's what the Greeks have. Um, that characterizes us. Tell us about the Greeks in Chicago. What have they done? Well, what haven't they done? You know, they've opened their own schools, but yet they've been very, very supportive of the traditional public schools. Uh, the, you know, the Greeks have been less inclined to get involved in politics and more inclined to get involved in philanthropy. I mean, the Greeks are extraordinarily philanthropic, and there are, are, are few initiatives or, or, or few charities uh, uh, that, do, that uh, do not involve and include prominent Greeks. You know, it's uh, you know we haven't gravitated toward politics like many of the they're other breeding, ethnic groups. Yeah, they're not interested. Or are we, you know, maybe we're too old, Greek American politicians? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's hard to say uh, in which direction the next generation will go. But you know, the Greeks, uh, the Greeks' greatest contribution. I mean, besides perhaps a know, disappointed. <laughs> I don't really want to well, I, I believe that more Greeks should get involved in politics. My boys don't want anything to do with politics. Right. They want me to run. And they'll be, you know, and, and had I not run, they would have been very disappointed. But it's not like they want to follow in my footsteps. They followed in their mother's footsteps because my, my wife was a police officer. But what the Greeks have really brought to Chicago is their entrepreneurial spirit. They're, I, I mean, they're just uniformly successful in business, in all businesses, in all walks of life. I mean, they've, they've, they've made extraordinary contributions to the uh, economy of Chicago. And obviously, you know, this is characteristic. Of, of of the Greek communities in in any city in any you, city right in any city where you find well large the Greeks are entrepreneurs Greeks. we're masters of our own souls as they're well we like always joke said. you know uh, people always say you know the Greeks are always fighting among themselves that's because Greeks don't like to work for anyone the Greeks want to work for themselves they're entrepreneurs but it's that entrepreneur spirit that that uh, that. Uh, uh, allows them to, to, to become major contributors in the communities that they settle in. So cut to, uh, you know, after serving as Illinois State uh, legislator for 10 years, now you have decided to run for mayor, a huge undertaking. I mean, I don't know where to begin. Uh, according to the Fiscal Times, Chicago ranks amongst the worst financially. Um, uh, you know, fit cities in the United States. Well, next States. to Memphis, it's an and F. <laughs> maybe next to Memphis and Detroit, Chicago is probably yeah. the worst debt debt to income ratio. Also, the city has lost 17 percent of its residential property value since the 2008 recession, where nationally residential property values have grown by about eight percent. And I mean, think about using losing 17 percent of your wealth. And when you 
go to Chicago and you go to the downtown or the three mile radius around the downtown, you see buildings and cranes and it looks like a, I mean, it, it looks like the most, uh, uh, you know, uh, it looks like there's more construction than, than you can even imagine. What that means is that there are areas of the city and, and actually about 80% of the city where there has been no investment, where the city, uh, the city's economy whether it comes to jobs or economic expansion or new investment it has, is either stagnant or, or it's in a state of decline. And there are communities in Chicago that, that are, uh, are, have been in, in, in a deep depression state for three to four decades. Many of those communities, which at one time uh, had large numbers of, of prominent Greeks. See, I grew up in the Rosen Pullman area. St. Spiridon was our first church before uh, 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 going to St. Constantine and Helen, which had the Greek school, the Koraia Greek school, the great uh, uh, theologian, our, 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 our great, uh, great uh, uh, priest, the, the late Father Byron Papa Nicolaou, uh, who mentored uh, Father, Father Alex, Alex Kalutas. Well exactly. When he was a young priest, the they, pillar of the Greek. They sent him to be mentored by the best. <laughs> the Greek and uh, but but Saint Spiridon, I mean that that community is it has it's four decades of depression. Uh, in fact, that community is so poor. <clears throat> when you when you walk up the avenue, they don't even have fast food Anymore. restaurants or fast food joints, let alone restaurants and and uh, uh, you know uh, retail stores, you know clothing stores, etc. But but Paul, <clears throat> you're talking about a forty billion in the red. You're undertaking forty billion. You guys have a. a I mean, it's it's uh, the Financial Times has written that the city has seven point one billion in assets and forty seven point six billion in expenses. I mean, that's a deep hole. What kind of incentives? What what are you going to do? What is your plan to help turn that around, and make Chicago a thriving city? How are you going to bring it around? How are we going to save these urban areas? Well, you know, a combination of, of things need to be done. Because I've I, I've always been a a, a an issue oriented person and 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 in uh, in all my undertakings I'm the type of I take you know sometimes to my detriment a professorial approach to things. In other words, this is the problem. This uh, this is how I'm going to solve it. My strategy is as follows: uh, the city has got to uh, has got to transform its its budgets into long term financial plans that make the type of investments in the communities to create the conditions for growth. And that's what they have, and, and that's not what they've been doing. You know, the budgets are political budgets. They, they defer, uh, you know, they defer the tough decisions to the next generation. They, they so-called kick the proverbial can down the road. So there's this uh, almost Washington, D.C. type mentality that budgets are political documents, not economic development documents, that pay to play, uh, uh, you know, uh, you don't make any tough decisions till after the election. Then you overwhelm people with tough decisions. There's just this. There, uh, there's an absence of long-term planning and long-term investment. And we, as Greek Americans, particularly those who have been in business, I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, our parents were all about uh, investing, investing uh, so that the next generation would have an easier uh, time would have fewer challenges than the previous generation. And we don't do that in government. It's, it's the politics of expediency, not the politics of long-term planning and long-term investment. So what I've done is I've laid out my strategy. You know, obviously we're, uh, we have a very important gubernatorial race coming up and I've laid out my agenda, uh, the Chicago agenda for the state because the both houses are overwhelmingly Democrat and they're probably gonna pick up votes, which means the both houses will probably have Democratic veto-proof majority. So I've laid out my agenda for the state, which is to stop imposing mandates on local governments and provide the funding for the mandates that they've imposed on us. I've laid out my agenda to to bring to to remove pay-to-play from the budget process and to bring spending under control. Uh, and then I've laid out a strategy to to in effect cap. Uh, future property tax increases mm -hmm. and future uh, increases in fees and fines. So people, both businesses, uh, uh, homeowners, landlords, they know they know that government is is not going to be taking more than they can afford to give, so that they can start planning for the future. Because if you don't know whether or not the state's going to be able to fund programs from year to year, or if you don't know from one year to the next 
whether your taxes are not going to go up or whether they're going to go up 20 percent, you can't plan. Right. So the idea is to is to move the city in the direction to where uh, uh, the city is engaging in sound financial practices and the city is investing in communities, not disinvesting in them. But you're balancing a budget that doesn't seem to have enough revenue. They don't have enough revenue. Right. And they don't have enough revenue for, for three reasons. Reason number one is the city's not growing. Uh, reason number two is they uh, uh, is they're not is they haven't made any real effort to bring efficiencies to the spending side. There's not a budget that I have never that I have not been able to, to cut by anywhere from five to ten percent. Because what people forget is when I left uh, the legislature, I was city revenue budget director and in school superintendent for for twelve years, and I not only balanced all all of my budgets, but in the Chicago Public Schools, I inherited a structural deficit of a billion dollars. And six years later, I left the school system with a billion dollars in cash balances. Right. I mean, by doing the exact things that I want to do at the city level, and then I did similar work like that in Philadelphia where I took over when those schools financially collapsed, and then, of course, rebuilding the school uh, school uh, uh, system in New Orleans after Katrina. So the bottom line is, you you have to take that type of an approach. So, so I feel by by having the the type of of an agenda that uh, that can be supported by the state, so that the uh, so that you the, have incentives. You have so that the city has incentives, so that the city is accessing the resources that are there and that are available. Because our, and creating our, new. That, that's right. And, and then by bringing spend, spending under, under control and then getting some control over our, our excessive continuing uh, uh, increase in taxes and fees, I think we can create conditions. Because ultimately, if, if a city's not growing, it's dying. And, and, and right now, when you lose 70% of your wealth, and the city has lost more uh, residents per, per capita than any of the major cities over the last 12 years. When that happens, when you have a city in decline, these problems are only going to worsen. And we're becoming the tale of two cities. Yes, you are. And I mean, just going into you know the public school system, academically, the United States in general is in the middle, ranking in the middle around the world. But you know, the, as the third uh, largest public school system in the United States, Chicago uh, is having um, a very big problem and inequitable uh, state education funding, and I mean, it's the lowest performing uh, public school system in the United States. Well, well, what are we going to do about that? The Chicago public schools, as a whole, have been improving academically, uh, and in fact, they've shown, I think, healthy uh, increases in academic performance. And and even since my departure, of course, over my six years, the schools improved every year for the six consecutive years. The problem with the schools, though. Uh, it, it's not that they're not improving. The problem with the schools is that uh, that their people are leaving the school system. The schools, the school enrollment has is seventy thousand fewer uh, students attend the Chicago Public Schools than attended the schools when I departed. During my six years in the Chicago Public Schools, enrollment grew every year. In, in fact, over the last forty years, the only six years that enrollment grew was during my six years. Why? Because we were expanding school choice, we were providing students with multiple options. So if they did not want to attend their struggling neighborhood school, there would be other educational opportunities for them. We stabilized the school district's finances. We brought school spending under control. So maybe people weren't getting all the resources they needed, but they were never having the financial rug pulled out from under them. So the net effect was people had more confidence. There were they're, they had confidence that there were more school choices, that the schools would open on time, that there would be union peace, that there would be financial stability. So, so this created conditions for growth. And as the schools grow, grew, we got more money, you see. I understand. My question is, though, academically, what can we do to increase or elevate uh, you know, the ranking of, of, uh, of the of public school systems in the United States? Right. Is there a breakdown? What do you think is going on? Do we need a reset? Do you think the public school system is failing? 
our well, citizens? Well, you know, it, it really depends. I mean, there are some public school systems that are thriving. There are others that are not. Look, there are some public schools systems that have promoted expanded choices through charter schools. There are some charter schools that are doing extraordinary work, many in New York. There are other charter schools that are struggling at the end of the day. First of all, there's no substitute for making, for expanding educational choices for children, particularly poor children. So whether it's expanding public school, uh, traditional public school education choices or expanding charter schools, the bottom line is high quality public school choices, whether they're pu regular public schools or public charter schools, uh, you know, as long as you're not creating excess capacity, it is a positive thing. And then holding, holding all those schools accountable. But, but of equal importance is, is making sure that schools have stability because teachers need to know the resources are going to be there and the supports are going to be there so that you're not playing politics with the school budgets. You're not changing leaders every other year. You're not changing curriculum. You're not going from feast to famine when it comes to budgeting because people need predictability. So there's no substitute towards providing education with the investment that, if, if you're gonna support expanded school choice, you need to support expanded school funding. And they have in New York, and they've made progress in accomplishing both. There's no substitute for that. I also think there, there's two other things that need to be done. Um, you make your school, first of all, there's no substitute for, for high standards, but, but uh, uh, the data shows that when there is more instructional time, when there's more time spent providing instruction, children do better. So the idea that you have more extended day and extended year educational opportunities, uh, that makes a difference. In New Orleans, the school system increased, the school system, formerly the second worst system in the state, led the state in growth for seven years. Why? Because the children had 30% more instructional time over those seven is years. Is that something that you want to uh, instill when you implement, when you become mayor? Absolutely. When I was city, uh, when I was CEO of the school district, we had two hours of extended day every day. So any child not academically at grade level received not one hour of additional instruction. They right. got a one hour of instruction and a second hour of coaching and enrichment. And then we did the same thing over the summer where children would spend an additional six weeks in school. Right. We did the same thing in New Orleans. That's a big game changer. I'll also tell you something else, part particularly when it comes to inner city schools with large number of children that, that are, uh, are that come from low income families, particularly large numbers of children uh, who sometimes uh, who are being raised by single parents and sometimes being raised by 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 t by children themselves. Right. There's no substitute for having uh, a comprehensive early childhood education, not waiting until they're four, but having the type of intervention that can reach first time mothers uh, the, from I call it prenatal to the classroom. We did a program in Chicago that I'm going to bring to scale when I was superintendent where we identified every pregnant teen, 99 percent low income pregnant teens. And we got them into, we assigned them a parent coach. We got them into prenatal care to make sure the babies were born healthy. And then we provided them with continual coaching, uh, covering the years up to when the children got into uh, preschool, which was, uh, we tried to get them in, in, into preschool earlier, but a, a lot of the preschool activity was actually the type of preschool activity where we would visit the home once a week uh, uh, with the mother, show the mother how to stimulate the child, make sure the child was signed up for health care. Anyway, to make a long story short, 2,500 pregnant teens went through this program. When the children hit third grade, now mind you, the 99% low income, 90, over 90% minority. When the children hit third grade, there was no achievement gap. None. No achievement gap. Crap. That's third grade is when the, the achievement gap uh, takes uh, takes over. That's when it's that's that's when it's most significant, in part because at third grade the children take tests on their own. And so uh, no achievement gap. The the mothers, we rarely identified the fathers, maybe ten percent, maybe less. The mothers who normally, teen, the pregnant teens have a 20% graduation rate. The mothers had a graduation rate of 90%, wow. 90%. And fewer than one-tenth of 1% 1 got pregnant a second time. So, so the, the, 
prenatal <clears throat> to three years are absolutely critical. It, critical, right. That's when most of the brain development occurs. Yes. And, and that's, when, that's when most of the most effective interventions can be brought to bear when you have children who have, who have, who have, uh, uh, who have physical needs, who have health care needs. I mean, there are so many children. The, the Illinois Hospital Association told, back in 2004 did a study where they said the cost of, of, to the hospitals for delivering babies from Medicaid mothers who have not had prenatal versus uh, who, those who have, have had prenatal was $250 million. That's $10 billion over 30 years. So, so doing that type of intervention can be transformational. This is a, a very important topic, and, I, and I'd like, I mean, it's a, it's a show in itself because there, the problem, I mean, it all starts from childhood. I mean, where we are today, it all stems from the gener new generation. That's right, that's a game changer. And that's the game changer. And if, if, if the educators are, and the public school system, you know, you, the leaders, are, are tackling this early on, we may have a better future right. for the new generation. There's one more thing, too, if I have a yes, minute. Yes, please, that, 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 have, please that, go on. This is an important that topic. I believe, that we'd like to hear what you have you to know, say. And, and, you know, I, I can't stress enough how transformational uh, a prenatal, even for New York, a prenatal, to, because right now the focus on early childhood is four-year-olds. By the time they're four, 70% of the brain development has already occurred. If there are health care, significant health care issues that haven't been addressed at the, the, those early ages, that's going to that's gonna plague the families. And, and, and at the end of the day, you know, taxpayers will be picking up the tab because of the long-term medical costs that will be needed to help that child, particularly if that child comes from a low-income family. So I, I can't stress enough. But, but on the, the back side, what we want to do and, and I, uh, is at the high school level, we want to go in and we want to uh, make available in all the high schools what I refer to as career, career and technical education electives. So when children are in the high schools, regardless of what high school they go to, and they, and they get beyond their sophomore year, when they're in their junior and senior year, there is no reason why they can't be spending half their day taking their core courses, college preparatory courses, and the other half of their day in career and technical education or in work study. There's a spectacular high school, it's called Cristo Rey. It's a Catholic high school uh, that was created, it's an independent high school, and it was created to help inner city kids and half the day, uh, you're in core classes till one o'clock, and then from one o'clock to five o'clock, you're working. You're working, you're learning a skill, you're getting paid, you see what I mean? You wanna keep kids in school? You wanna keep them in school. Exactly, you wanna teach them a trade? You wanna keep them occupied. That's right, you wanna keep them occupied. And, and, and even for college-bound kids. So what, what, what I'm gonna to wanna to do, and the technology is now such where you don't need to invest a lot of money in vocational ed because so much of the career and technical education can be provided in an online environment like coding, like manufacturing. There, there are so many career and technical education programs that can now be offered in a blended learning environment. Right. So it's not like the old wood shops or it's not, the yeah. old auto right. shops, you see. It's much more sophisticated. If you did that, if you did technical, cradle digital, at, right. at, at the front end, and at the back end told students when they're in their junior and senior year, they can be taking courses for dual credit at the college or university, or they can be in career and technical education or paid work study, they're not gonna drop out. They're gonna stay. And when and they're gonna be ready for the work world because they will have already spent time in that environment. And that's significant. And yeah. that's that's the game changer. Right. <laughs> um, well, on that point, let's talk about urban violence, which okay. is affecting our schools. Uh, you know, Chicago ranks 12th on, on murders uh, in the city. We have more murders than in LA. In the country, I'm sorry. In LA and New York. In LA and New York. Is, right. is, I mean, is Chicago becoming the new Detroit? Well, you know, Michigan. Chicago's violence stems from two reasons. One is, uh, there's really only investment going on in maybe 10 of the 50 wards. We have 50 aldermen, if you can believe it. So, uh, so in 80% of the city, there's no development. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, it, the, uh, there are many communities that are in depression states. In, in fact, there's a, a community in the Rolls and Pullman area where, where over half the men are in some phase of the criminal justice system with no hope for work, no opportunities. So that creates conditions for violence. The second thing is, uh, the, 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 uh, the unilateral uh, uh, degradation of the police department. 
We didn't fill 2,000 police vacancies. We allowed our detectives division to shrink from 1,200 to less than 700. You know how many detectives you have in New York? 4,500. 15% of your, your workforce. In Chicago, it's maybe well, five, Well, that's why our crime is down. That's right. That's right. G getting rid of the supplemental right. units. So by degrading the police department, uh, we're, we're simply not getting the violent offenders off the street. So, for example, uh, only 5% of the uh, shootings are solved. Only 15% of the murders are solved. Think about that for a second. So we, and, and, and look, I'm, I'm speaking from the heart uh, because I come from a family of four police officers. W one member of the family was a police officer, a Chicago police officer. He has passed away. My dad's the only sibling. My two boys are, my one boy is a police officer from a large suburb. And, uh, and, and my second uh, of Chicago, my second is a police officer in San Antonio. My wife was a retired police officer. So, but the bottom line is you can't degrade your you police department. You cannot degrade, but how do you feel about the president and his emphasis on, on supporting uh, the law enforcement and giving more budget? Well, look, I, you know, I think if the president really wanted to make a difference uh, in Chicago, he would do two things. Uh, um, number one, uh, you know, he would... I hate to say this because, you know, the president doesn't like to copy from other presidents, but he would take a, uh, a page out of the Clinton administration when they created the COPS program. And that was a program that stimulated the hiring of COPS to expand. And, and, you know, I took advantage of the COPS program, and I was able to put a record number of police officers on the, uh, on the street. The second thing is the U.S. Attorney's Office the, 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 uh, uh, the has, has to has to be aggressive about prosecuting uh, people for gun offenses under federal law. The federal pen penalties are very tough. And Chicago is near the bottom when it comes to federal prosecution for gun violations. Right, but I'm going to pass you on now to gun laws. I mean, what, what do you want to do to enforce gun laws? Well, look, you know, look, you know, I... I being a school superintendent, they need to be more regulated. Don't you believe that? Well, I believe I believe that you need to have extensive background checks. Look, you don't want the, the cops will tell you. Talk to the police officers. You know, you don't want people uh, to, to, to be able to get access to guns without extensive background checks. And that's not an infringement. That's not a, an, an infringement on their constitutional rights. You know, that's not taking guns away. But having, you know, because how often have we seen cases where individuals. Uh, uh, with highly questionable background, who have committed heinous crimes, were able to access weapons. They, the weapons were either not secured, they were able to access weapons despite their, their questionable mental health, etc. So there's no substitution for aggressive background checks. It's not a, about trying to get background checks so we can take weapons away. But uh, So the resistance against reasonable background checks or the resistance against armor-piercing shells and, you know, some of the weapons, the type of weapons and the types of, of ammo that put police at, at a disadvantage it, it needs to be changed. But that said and done, the trend, the trend is not in that direction. Uh, I don't see any significant progress being made on responsible gun, uh, gun laws or the changes in gun laws. Uh, uh, at the federal level, or for that matter, at the state level. In fact, in fact, uh, you know, who would have ever thought 20 years ago that we would have carry and concealed? So, uh, so at the end of the day, you know, the city can pass all the gun regulations it wants. It doesn't matter. The guns are going to get in. The guns are coming across the city border. So, so given that condition, you've got to do three things. Number one, number one, you've got to arrest people. And when you don't have enough cops and you don't have enough you detectives. You can't you know, chase you them, can't, you can't arrest them. Yeah, yeah, exactly, number one. Number two, you've got to prosecute them. You know, I, I'm all for uh, alternative sentencing for nonviolent offenders. But if somebody is an offender and it involves the illegal or, or the use of a weapon or the illegal possession of a weapon or the violation of gun laws, that person needs to be prosecuted. There needs to, there's no quarter on prosecuting people for violating gun laws. And then the third thing, is sentencing, is sentencing. You, once you start, once you start arresting, charging, and sentencing uh, uh, individuals who violate gun laws to like long time, you know, you once you start giving them real, uh, really aggressive, long sentences for violating gun laws, the message will get out. In Illinois, we're we're not doing either of these things. 
We're not arresting them. We're not prosecuting them. We're not sentencing them. So, so you know, there's no more effective deterrent than arrest, than prosecution, and and uh, and and sentencing. And and Chicago is third from the bottom when it comes to prosecutions for gun violations under federal law. That's unacceptable. So if the Trump administration wanted to really help Chicago, uh, he would have the, you know, he would have the the U.S. Attorney General's office in there working aggressively uh, to ensure that these individuals were being, were, were being charged under federal gun laws. Well, we hope that you, uh, you get there and help them initiate that. I'm trying my best. Absolutely. And uh, we just want to wish you the best, uh, Thank Mr. You. Vallis. I love everything you've said today, and we hope that uh, the people of Chicago uh, hear you. You have a lot to say, and everything you're saying is problem solving, basically. Paul Vallis, problem solver, not politician, <laughs> running for mayor of Chicago, Illinois. Thank you for being with us here today. We wish you the best of luck. And thank you, and, and, and my best to your listeners. And I want to thank them for their patience to my somewhat overwhelming No, answers. no, no, not at all. Very informative, very necessary, and we need our citizens to listen because these are, you know, the, the reasons that we're having all these problems, and we need to reset. And so thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.